create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Let me be like you in all my ways. Give me your strength. Teach me your song. Shelter me in the shadow of your wings, for we are your righteousness. If we die to ourselves and live through your death, we shall be born again to be blessed in your in me a clean heart, O oh God. Let me be like you in all my ways. Give me your strength. Teach me your song. Shelter me in the shadow of your sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and go into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin before God and one another. <laughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and solely by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our opening hymn. 
sing this morning is number 807, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You lead back to yourself all those who go astray. Preserve your people in your loving care, that we may reject whatever is contrary to you, and may follow all things that sustain our life in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. First reading this morning is from the Exodus, chapter 32, verses 7 through 14. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people, whom you brought up out of the land of Egypt, have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it, and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may grow hot against them, and I may continue consume them, and of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God and said, O oh Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath and change your mind, and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and 
Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of the heavens, and all of this land that I have promised, I will give to you your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. Thanks be to God. The psalm is Psalm 51, verses 1 through 10. <clears throat> Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. In your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me thorough and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within me. Remove my sin with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. The second lesson is from the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, starting with verse 12. I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saving, saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy so that in me, as he for foremost, Jesus Christ might display the most utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be glory and honor forever and ever. Amen. Thanks be to God. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel lesson? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming there to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. 
Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. This is the gospel, or excuse me, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together one, her, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from him who was, who is, and who is yet to come again, Jesus the living Christ. Amen. Well, in the gospel text today, we have two parables, and they are certainly ordered towards that which is lost and then that which is found. So I want to speak to you about that, and particularly in this context, on this, uh, on these parables that are given to us. Well, on first reading, the parables might appear to be pretty clear in understanding what they mean. But on careful examination, when you really stop and spend some time, they seem a bit odd and strange. We know that Jesus often used parables and uh, in trying to capture something about our human experience and help us understand how we might behave or how we might respond to the good news of forgiveness and reconciliation. For example, a man finds a hidden treasure in a field, so he takes all of his savings and buys the field. A dishonest manager learns that he is about to be fired, so he hurries to use his position to feather his nest before the axe falls. Hmm. That sounds a bit odd. Is Jesus speaking about that? Now, he's certainly not condoning this kind of behavior, but he is saying that if you would use your intelligence to make a dollar or to gain worldly advantage for yourself, why would you not do the same to gain the kingdom of God? But the parables in today's lesson are different. The characters demonstrate behavior that we would not follow. No shepherd in his right mind would abandon 99 in the wilderness while he went searching for one single stray. We I mean, just think about it. So you're gonna put the whole 99 at risk, but that's really not the point of the parable. But as you read it at face value, that's what it appears. So what? You wanna leave 99 to go get the one? And no woman in her right mind would, would turn her house upside down to find a single coin. And other texts say that she spent more than that, than the lost coin, to celebrate his recovery. So does that make sense? I, it, you know, you wonder, well, these parables illustrate lavish, disproportionate, seemingly irrational behavior. And the reason for that is that they are not primarily parables about us or our behavior as much as they are parables about who our God is, how God relates to us, and what God does for us. And the context here, I think, is important. As Luke describes it, sinners and tax collectors were flocking to hear what Jesus had to say. Juxtapose that to Pharisees who think they know everything that God has said. <laughs> and they've got it all together. They're checking all the blocks. And thus they were offended. And at the same time, the Pharisees were interested, however, in him and his teaching. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been invited to table with them. So if you put those two together, what are we beginning to see here? The Pharisees, perhaps, represent the 99. And the one represented the tax collectors and sinners and Gentiles. You begin to see something here about who our God is. And they don't have a clue. The Pharisees don't get it. They don't understand what is happening and who it is who is right before them. They looked on Jesus as being too liberal, too willing in their eyes to be inclusive at the cost of violating the word of God, the laws of God, the everyday practice of righteousness. 
But at the same time, they are those who are seeking a right relationship with God. And Jesus himself is accommodating not only them, but tax collectors and sinners. They are passionate, and they are critics. But here they raise a question about Jesus' table fellowship with prostitutes and scoundrels and so on. And Jesus responds with these parables of the lost sheep and the lost coin. So how are we to understand these parables and their meaning? The interpretive key to both parables is in the concluding statement. As Jesus says, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents over the 99 who need no repentance. He calls them 99 righteous persons. If, you were, if I were a Pharisee, then I'm thinking, hmm, you know, ooh, <laughs> wait a minute. And again, there is joy in the presence of angels over one sinner who repents. And in fact, Jesus is saying that the sinners who he has been eating with are precious to God. They were lost, and now they have been found, and God rejoices in their recovery. When I think of this story, I, I was reminded in preparing uh, this uh, of a story that uh, Joe Glass told years ago. Many of you know or knew Joe. Yeah, absolutely. He was at Lenore Rhine, and uh, I heard this story in, I think, 1993, <laughs> and it stuck with me. It's a wonderful story. It's a story about the, uh, the, little, the little boy who built a boat for himself. Do you know that story? It's a wonderful story. It's about a boy who was very clever and built a wooden boat. And it was the finest of boats. He spent hours and hours crafting it. And um, it was delightful. And he made sure that it was capable of floating. And when it was ready, he sailed it in the water holes and rain flooded ditches near his home. With a piece of string attached to his boat and with the power of his imagination, you can imagine what this young boy was thinking. He could sail the mighty seas on deck as a skipper, you know. Imagination ran wild. And one day he brought the boat to the river and played with it. The river's current was swift. And as the boat moved out into the middle, the string that kept the boat within its maker's reach broke. And the boat was carried away downstream clear out of sight. The boy took off and searched and searched to no avail. It was as if the boat was hiding from him or the river was playing tricks on him. He didn't find the boat. It was lost. He continued his search. Couldn't find it. One day while he was in town, he passed by a store and as he looked into the window, he saw his boat in a pile of wood scraps in front of a stove. The store owner had scavenged the neighborhood for wood to keep him warm. And the, he had found his boat somehow, some way. And the boy rushed in and told the store owner that the boat was his. He had made it, it got lost, but now he had found it. Just a minute, young man. The store owner said, I worked hard finding all this wood for my stove, and you just can't have it. How do I know you're telling me the truth? You can pay me for it, though. Then I'll let you have it. The boy ran out of the store and immediately went to work. He wanted to have that boat. He loved his boat, his own creation. He soon had the money and returned to the store. And he did so just as the store owner was about to use the boat in the next kindling for the fire. Wait, he shouted, I have what is needed. He handed his hard-earned money to the man by the fire and grabbed his boat, rejoicing, happy as he could be, and he left the store. As he was walking down the street holding on tightly to his little creation, he was overheard to say, now you are twice mine. First I made you, and then I bought you. 
It's just a lovely, wonderful story, I believe. It captures so much <coughs> about being lost and being found and who our God is in seeking us. There's a, there are a number of things that can be drawn from this particular lesson. But I wanted to uh, reflect with you about what this means for us. Well, first of all, let's think about the first lesson in Exodus. Well, what do the people of God do? They what created a golden calf and worshiped a golden calf, and they basically were lost, weren't they? I mean, you, you think about it, they had turned, and God's anger was burning hot towards them. Moses, in that regard, had a bit more, at least, you know, give, give God a reality check in some way, his anger. We all need that reality check when we're, you know, certainly. And Moses did that, and God changed God's mind. I will not destroy what I've created. Second lesson, Psalm 51. That psalm is from David. And it was written, as it is reported, shortly after his affair with Bathsheba and of being called to account. Thou art the man. You, you recall the, the, the stories, you know. And so he turns to God in his own brokenness. And God did create in him a clean heart. Did not destroy him. The other lesson. Then the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy speaks of what? That he deserved to be condemned, deserved to be lost. But he gives all credit, certainly, to God and Jesus Christ, who came seeking him and found him and gave him new life and a new way of being and of living and of loving and of serving and proclaiming. So, the lessons are full of this today, from beginning to end, absolutely, of what it is and who, who it is that seeks us who are lost and who it is who finds us, who finds us. All these texts today assure us that however far we may fall short of God's expectations in missing the mark, however far we stray from God's ways and sin, God will come looking for us. I, I have counseled myself and also parents related to holy baptism. You know, you, you raise children, you do have concerns about where they will go and what they will get into. I know, I got into some things when I was a very young man. <laughs> when I was a, in fact, I told someone this past week, one of the best things my parents ever did for me was to move me from one school in the ninth grade to a new school because I was not going down the right road. I was lost over here. <laughs> really, I was no, I was with the wrong crowd. So they switched schools and that was a wonderful thing. But I have counseled myself and parents and said to them, once you're marked with the cross of Christ, you can run, but you cannot hide. We have a pursuing God who will not let us go. Absolutely, we do. God comes looking for us. And God seeks to overcome that which separates us from him. And God will literally carry us. I love this image of the good shepherd carrying a lamb. Okay. Will literally carry us to a new place with him, with ourselves and our neighbors. And so we begin to see that, you know, like the boat, I made it, created it, I lost it. And then what did our Lord do? Emptied himself becoming one of us in order to buy us, to redeem us. It means to, to redeem. I think of um, those who were in Vietnam 
this is a true story, but a long range reconnaissance patrol went out and was dropped behind the North Vietnamese lines. And as they made their way through the jungle, they got into a fierce firefight. It was savage. After a few moments, both sides broke off contact. And the Americans began to retreat two miles back to the landing zone for the pickup. And as they ran, the leader counted heads. There was one missing. He held up his hand and everybody stopped. And then as they stood there, they could hear the voice. Help me, don't leave. And so indeed they went back to the battle area and they found him. He'd been wounded in both legs and they picked him up and carried him back to the landing zone. He who surely was lost, was found and was safe. The wounded man said, I knew that if you left me there, I would never make it out. Think about the rangers and first responders. What's one of the mottos they have? No man left behind. No man left behind. We learn much here. First, each and every one of us is of supreme worth to God. Each and every one of us is of supreme worth to God. I'll say it again because we need to hear it. <laughs> Each and every one of us is of supreme worth to God. Absolutely. The so-called righteous in the text today and the identified sinners are precious to God. In the journey of life, amidst the battles of this world, God will not abandon us. God is in hot pursuit of us. We are not left alone as those who are lost. God unyieldingly seeks us out. Second, God cares for us so much that God is willing to do whatever it takes to bring us home to him. God cares for us to the point that God underwent his personal sacrifice for us in the incarnation of his son. For God so loved the world that what? He sent his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. This is a proclamation that God does not intend for us to be lost, but rather to be found in him. <coughs> Our Lord endured the cross as the ultimate symbol of sacrifice and compassion in seeking out a people who were lost in sin, who were separated from God. God so loved the world that his son resurrected from the dead, overcoming sin and death and evil to remove all that has and is and will separate us from God. And God so loved the world that the Holy Spirit was poured out into the church to be our counselor and comforter. Nothing has and nothing will stop God's endless, hot, passionate pursuit of us, both as individuals and collectively as a community. There's both of them. Third, in this text, we see that God wants us to be found. God knows that we are those who desperately need to be found. You know, as well as I do, when, you're, when you get a little off track. There are times, you know, a sense of conscience, maybe a word from someone in the life of your community, perhaps in the family, you realize, I'm a little off here, <laughs> you know. But our Lord seeks us out. And you know, there is a human, there is in the human heart the desire to be found. You remember playing the, the game hide and seek? Oh yeah, wonderful, right? I mean, I used to love to go out to my, my uh, grandmother and granddad's out in, uh, near Sanford, North Carolina, and uh, on the farm and play hide and seek. Yeah. But, you know, it was great to play hide and seek, but what happens if you're not found? 
you ever do that? <laughs> you know, you're like, well, we can't, can't find him, so, so what do you do? You don't like to be lost. <laughs> you want to be found, you know? Just for a little while, you want to be lost, but you don't want to be found forever and be excluded and left out. So, you know, we want, there is something in the human heart that we want to be found. We don't want to stay lost. Lost. In fact, it's a terrible thing to be lost, to be separated from God, to be separated from each other, and even separated or divided within ourself. And that can happen as well, and it does happen. So our greatest fear is that of being abandoned. But it's even more tragic to be lost and not know it. It's even more, you know, it's, it's bad enough being lost and knowing that you're lost, but then tragic to be lost and to not know it. But God seeks us out to carry us to, to that which will satisfy the longings of the human heart. So I, I think uh, following this text is the uh, story of the prodigal son. He was lost and didn't know it. That's an example of that. You know, so you could carry on this particular theme. Three points I'll make, I'll draw from this, and then I'll just close. Don't ever forget, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that you are of supreme worth to God. Yes, God fashioned you, made you in God's image. So you have the signature of nobility of who you are as a child of God. You are of supreme worth. Therefore, God seeks you out to be in relationship now and forever. Secondly, God has gone to great lengths to seek you out, to find you, the one who created you is the one who seeks to redeem you and who did redeem you on the cross in the sacrifice of his son. God's passion is that all those created in his image be found. Thirdly, God knows the yearning of the human heart. God seeks you out so that you may know the joy and the peace of being found. That's what the Apostle Paul gives testimony to. You know, about all that he went through, he said, thanks be to God in Jesus Christ. It's joy of knowing that he is not lost, that he is in God and with God, and God walks with him. Indeed, God and God alone can fulfill the desire of your human heart. If you think or feel that your life is of no value, or if you feel lost, or if you're experiencing despair or fear or overwhelming anxiety or hopelessness, certainly that's part of the human experience. But that's not all of our experience because of God and Jesus Christ. We are given a presence and a power and a peace in our lives. They can come up, come up alongside of that and work in and through it to a new reality in our lives. And we are found as God comes to us and we respond by faith. So it is, as Luther said, and as the Apostle Paul said, it is by grace through faith that we are saved, and it is by grace through faith that we are able to know and live an abundant life. But that is only on account of what God and Jesus Christ has done for us, to seek us, to buy, to pay for us. And so as we come to know who we are, and that we are truly found, we become those who can proclaim and who can rejoice as God rejoices that by grace, indeed, that we who once were lost are now found. Can I hear an amen from Lutherans? Amen. amen. <laughs> Good. All right.
please uh, stand as you're able, and we will sing our hymn of the day, which is Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, 779. So let us gather our prayers for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. Your people receive mercy, and your grace overflows in our lives. Fill our church with faith and love, and give understanding hearts to those who work to strengthen our ecumenical and interreligious commitments. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your creation groans as it suffers the impacts of pollution and lack of care. As the seasons change, renew in us the will to protect plants, animals, and habitats. Bless us with bountiful harvests that all may share. God of grace, Amen. your world is shattered and the nations rage. Remember us in your mercy. Teach wisdom to our elected leaders so that we know peace in our world, peace in our homes, and peace in our hearts. God of grace. Your children wander homeless and hungry, and they cry for bread. Seek out those who are lost or lonely, anxious or depressed. 
or struggling with addiction or illness. Provide for those who face challenges to their health as we pray for Beverly, Glenn, Tim, Ruby, Cliff, John, Anne, Wayne, Stella, Floyd, Bobby, Judy, Florence, John, Sarah, Gail, Hoover, Wayne, Brenda, Nick, Vera, Jean, Jim. We also lift up to you those who are grieving. Grant what it is you see that they need. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your work done in this congregation is done by our hands, feet, voices, minds, and hearts. Build up the ministries of this community that we share, our, where we serve our neighbors and welcome strangers in your name. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your blessed saints who have died now rest in your presence. Give us thankful hearts for those who have been examples of faith in our lives and receive us with joy when we come to share eternal life with you. God of grace, hear our prayer. Your holy church turns to you for your presence and your power in and through word and sacrament. We give you thanks that you continue to call forth <clears throat> and to bring forth leaders in your church both lay and pastoral. We especially pray for the congregation of Amazing Grace as it moves towards securing, perhaps calling a new pastor to serve here. We also pray for the congregation of Friendship Lutheran Church as they begin a new chapter in their life with the call of Pastor Joshua Tucker. Continue to walk with this congregation and friendship and all who Look to you, God of grace, hear our prayers. Gather together in the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, gracious God, we offer these and all of our prayers to you, both said and unsaid, through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us share the peace of Yes. 
Would you please stand? Let us pray. Gracious God, in your great love, you richly provide for our needs. Make of these gifts a banquet of blessing and make us ready to share with all in need through Jesus Christ, who sets a table for all. Amen. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love, you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup gave thanks and gave her for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his birth, death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be our honor and glory now and forever. Amen. And now we are bold to pray the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May we see.
Would you please stand? May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God of the abundant table, you have refreshed our hearts in this meal with bread for the journey. Give us your grace on the road that we might serve our neighbors with joy. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now the God who gives life to all things and frees us from despair, bless you with truth and peace. And may the Holy Trinity, one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, guide you always in faith, hope, and love. Amen. Amen. Our sending hymn this morning is number 676. Lord, speak to us that we may speak. beside you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. I got a meeting for y'all. <laughs> y'all know it was a coming, don't you?